Today is the first uh, Sunday of the month, and so we'll be celebrating uh, the Lord's uh, Supper uh, later to remember all that He has done for us through His Son, uh, Jesus Christ. Our call to confession comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Again, this is God's Word. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And our prayer of confession will be on the screen. We'll be reading that together. Lord Jesus Christ, at your first coming, you warned us to prepare for the day when you shall come to judge the world in righteousness. Mercifully grant that being awake from the sleep of sin, we may humbly repent of the same and receive your forgiveness. You came to seek and save the lost, that we might not fall under judgment, but have the gift of eternal life. So we pray that through the grace of your first advent to save the world, we may be made ready to meet you at your second advent as the sheep of your flock, ready to enter into the inheritance you have prepared for us by your life, death, and resurrection. In your holy name, amen. Assurance of pardon comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is God's Word. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Amen and amen. walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He will be our wonderful counselor, he will be our mighty God. Not far down the family line of Jesus, we find a scared and shaking sinner who in the middle of her fear found God to be just what she needed, a mighty fortress. Rahab stood at the door of her hole in the wall motel and trembled. She wasn't just concerned, she was terrified. She knew that the city of Jericho was no match for God, who had split the Red Sea and routed massive armies. She knew her idols were fake and that the God of Israel was real. So when soldiers came to capture the men who had shown up seeking safety, Instead of turning the spies over to an angry king, Rahab threw herself on the mercy of a mighty God. When the walls in her world came tumbling down, our mighty God held her close and gently set her down in the center of his special family. As Gospel writer Matthew records in the genealogy of Jesus, Nashon was the father of Solomon, and Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab was weak, but God was strong. 
She was petrified, but he was powerful. And her story of rescue and redemption reminds us that we too have saved from our deepest fear, the fear of death, by the bloodstained cross and the empty tomb of the one and only one strong enough to meet our hopes and conquer our fears. The light of today's candle glows to remind us that our mighty God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into his glorious kingdom. Let us pray. O oh, Father in heaven, as we continue in the season of Advent, this time of wonder at your coming to dwell among us, thank you for being our mighty God. Thank you for being a fortress for the fearful and for sending Jesus to give his life so we could live. When we find ourselves scared and shaking, may we rest in the power of your grace and may we rejoice in the strength of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.
God's Word from Romans 8, 32. God, who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how we not also with Him graciously give us all things. Pray with me. Father, we thank You for Your generosity, Your graciousness in our lives. Open uh, our Open our eyes to see more of that. Forgive us when we take it for granted. Uh, Father, And whenever we are uh, feeling uh, less content than we should, uh, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and the cross, because there you have given us your very best. And if you have given us your very best, Father, help us to give our very best back to you, our time, our talents, and our spiritual, our uh, financial resources. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray with me as we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, which we will be in through the rest of the weeks of Advent. Father, we thank you for your word and for this uh, discourse of Jesus in preparation. Lord, give us ears to hear and to heed what you would say to us today through your spirit and your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 24, beginning at the 36th verse, 
a common reading for Advent season. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Amen. Are you ready? That's a familiar question this time of year. We ask each other, are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? Meaning, what? Have you done your shopping? Have you decorated? Uh, Have you planned your meals? Have you made travel plans or activities prepared? Are you ready? We ask. And Advent is a time for getting ready. But ready for what? Ready to celebrate Christmas, uh, for sure. Ready to celebrate the incarnation. Ready to celebrate the miracle of God taking on human flesh, being born of Mary in the town of Bethlehem. The miracle of of God fulfilling the scriptures of the Old Testament regarding uh, the Messiah. Uh, ready to worship God for His indescribable gift to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be called Jesus because He would save His people from their sins, who would be called the Christ, that's the Greek uh, word for Messiah, again, in fulfillment of uh, all that the Old Testament was pointing towards. We celebrate. We celebrate family birthdays, and it's a, a pretty big deal. We sometimes get notices that it's some celebrity's birthday or a politician's birthday. Don't you want to wish them birthday greetings? <laughs> Not on the top of my list. Sorry. But family, yes, it's a big deal. And a big part of the big deal is the time. You make time for those expressions of love and appreciation. Well, Christmas is a celebration of a very real, universally important, eternally significant birth, the birth of Jesus Christ. And Advent is a time to prepare for such a celebration. And uh, a large part of that is taking time to gather and to recognize and the other preparations that go uh, into birthday celebrations. But Advent is not intended to be a month-long Christmas celebration. It's Advent. When we treat it as a month-long Christmas celebration, or we succumb to cultural or marketing pressures to do so, by the time we get to Christmas Day, be honest, what are we often thinking? We're glad it's over. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that horrible? We're glad it's over. When actually it's not over at all, we've just begun the 12 days of Christmas. We've finished Advent. And if we use Advent for what Advent is for, We will be glad when Christmas Day arrives, and we will embrace those days leading up to Epiphany, remembering the gifts of the Magi, gifts that were fit for a king when they finally arrived to worship. So when Advent is rightly in view, and we take time to daily reflect on who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what He is doing, what He has promised yet to do, why He came. And how his miraculous birth points to this great truth that Jesus is Emmanuel. That he is God with us. And he is for us. The Advent readings and the Advent wreath are wonderful traditions that help us to remember we're in Advent. We're in this time of expectation and preparation. 
the devotionals such as the one that Starla writes during this season of the year. And if you don't receive, ask Starla Shatler about receiving her devotionals. She'll be glad to get you on her email. Or my daughter gave me a book this year, Hope Has Come, The Promise of Christ in All of Scripture. It's Advent. It helps prepare us. But our passage today is clearly not about the birth of Jesus, is it? Matthew includes the lengthiest discourse by Jesus on the parousia, on the second coming, on the second advent. And Jesus' message in these chapters, chapters 24 and 25, can be summed up about one question. Are you ready? He was asking them. A lot of popular prophecy teachers have created end-time scenarios very different from and far more complex than what Jesus taught. At the same time, they have also raised an awareness for the church and for those not yet a part of the body of Christ, that we need to be ready for Christ's expected return. Are you ready? Matthew 24 and 25 is this long discourse about the end times, and the key to understanding them and unlocking them is right here in the passage. Verse 3, there are two distinct questions that the disciples ask and that Jesus is answering. The questions are these, when will these things be? And second, what will be the sign of your coming? And the close of the age. And Jesus will deal primarily with that first question in verses 4 through 28. And then he moves and shifts to dealing with the second question. And we're looking at that part of the passage today. Clearly persecution will become a greater reality. He's promised uh, uh, and and warned that that would happen. Uh, That they will be hated for his sake, he has said. That wickedness will increase as the love of many grows cold, 2 Timothy 3, 3. And in the face of the coming persecution, Jesus instructs his disciples and Matthew's first hearers and you and me as we hear this passage today to stand firm that the kingdom must be preached to the entire world and then the end will come. We are to stand firm knowing that. Jesus is certain of his return. He says no one knows the day and the hour that not even the angels of heaven nor the Son can tell the precise day or hour. Only the Father knows. And Jesus, of course, here is speaking in his limited full human nature that he willfully took that on, that self-limitation. But people have never really been ready for such a momentous time. And so Jesus points them to the days of Noah. No one had a clue that the world was about to come to a watery end. It was sudden. It was cataclysmic. But there had been warnings given. People may have thought that Noah was a conspiracy theorist until the rain came. Funny how that happens at different levels, huh? Living in South Florida, we know when June 1st rolls around, we got to do what? Get ready. Get ready. And when that first storm comes along, we see that cone. And they tell us over and over again that if you're in the cone, you need to be ready. But then they put that line. And we all follow the line. And Hurricane Ian came up the West Coast. Fort Myers knew they were coming right by, but the line said Tampa. But it wasn't. (laughs) And on the Monday before it hit, Clinell and I were over at Fort Myers, and they were not getting ready. There was no serious preparation going on whatsoever, even at the beach. And then it came. The very suddenness of Christ's coming again points to the necessity 
to guard against unpreparedness and carelessness. The, the reference to the days of Noah, Jesus making the point that uh, life kind of just goes on as always, that there was no extra signs except the preaching of Noah and this guy building this giant boat. Genesis chapter 5 through 7. But he was warning the people. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that. They refused to take heart to what he was doing and what he was saying. They were unconcerned. Jesus says that they continued to live as always, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Not that there's anything wrong with any of those activities. That's exactly what we will be doing when Jesus returns. We will be found doing all of that and more and we do all things to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The problem is when the soul becomes entirely wrapped up in the events and the activities of this life so that they become an end in themselves and our identity is then caught up in what we do or our identity is caught up in some construct of our being rather than first and foremost, we are image bearers of the living God. And when that part of our priorities get off, then our spiritual priorities are neglected. And then the very things that are intended to be a blessing for us in this life become a curse. They become evidences of gross materialism or uh, false security or sometimes just a cold selfishness. Or the biblical world word for all of that is idolatry. We get caught up in idolatry. So this section tells us that no one knows the time of his coming. No specific times uh, mark out that time, verses 7, 37 through 39. That no change in involvements uh, of the necessary pursuits of life are going to preempt uh, this final separation, verses 40 through 44. And so the emphasis is on preparedness. We will continue to associate very freely with the world, with culture, with society. But we also know that we have a different relationship with the Master. And that there will be divisions coming, for one will be taken and one left, Jesus says. Much has been written about this in terms of the rapture, uh, certainly more than it says. Jesus is emphasizing that we need to be ready for his coming. A coming at an hour that you do not expect. Verse 44, are you ready? And so suddenly the flood came. The people of Noah's day didn't recover their senses. They failed to realize their perilous situation until it was <coughs> too late. And suddenly the cataclysm, and that's the word used in the original, a cataclysm came. But note this, God waited patiently for 120 years, three entire generations for people to repent. But there was no change. And God was morally free to bring the flood of judgment without anyone being able to say, hey, if you had just waited a bit longer, we were going to repent. We were going to get our acts together. You, you just jumped the gun. Mm -mm. And similarly, we ask the question, when can Jesus come, bring an end without people saying, well, if he had only been more patient and would have waited, we too would have been saved. I would submit that we are in that time of waiting now. And from the reference to Noah, Jesus was telling us that we can infer that uh, perhaps the time will come when humanity has so wrapped itself in knots, so misconstrued and uh, confused things, he was doing well. It's the parents, don't blame the little one. Um, when society gets so confused and misconstrues so much, maybe to wait longer won't make any difference. Second Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some 
counts slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What Jesus makes clear is that his coming is not something we can run away from. Two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding meal. One will be taken and the other left. We can't run from the event. It's a cosmic moment that marks the end of history as we know it. So Jesus is asking, are you ready? Given all that we hear Jesus saying that no one knows when, the best we can do then is to be ready. If a homeowner had known, he says, that a thief was coming, he would have certainly kept his house safe. But since we can't know when the thief, Jesus, and remember, that's the description he uses for himself in this coming, the thief coming in the night, The only way to be ready is to have a continuous watch, to stay awake, to keep watch, to be on the alert. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen immediately. Obviously, that's not what Jesus was saying, but it borrows from the image of the night watchman. Why were you sleeping? Well, no one ever comes. It's never a problem. Well, there was a problem tonight. Your job is to make sure that if there's a problem, you're ready. If you know a neighborhood is experiencing a crime problem with theft, the neighborhood makes some adjustments. Make sure your car is not left open and the key is in it. You lock your doors. You make sure the alarm is set and whatever other preparations you make, you you do that. And for the same reason, with a view toward the coming of the Lord, everyone is called to be ready. Verse 44, therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. It's a matter of finality. There will be no repentance after that. It means that we're to recognize that God is holy, absolutely holy, and we are not. And therefore we confess our sin and we receive gladly The free forgiveness of grace that He offers us through His Son, Jesus Christ. There's no merit on our part. Being ready doesn't mean, well, i got to get my life together. I'm going to get this done and this done and this done and this done and then... No. The very first thing is faith in Christ. And then our motivation follows as followers of Jesus with a meaningful relationship with Jesus that it's not out of fear of the end. It's not out of fear of punishment or judgment. We don't enter into an artificial approach to life. In fact, Jesus at the beginning uh, or in the previous chapter expresses his disdain for the religious leaders going through the motions and the rituals and the activities, but with no real change of heart. When I first got married, I was working at a cement plant, and there was a repairman who would walk around with a large wrench and a flashlight. He told me one day, I walk around with the wrench and the flashlight because then the foremen think I'm doing something. (laughs) It wasn't that he was ready to jump in and help solve a problem. It was that they wouldn't ask him to go fix something because they thought he was already going to fix something and he would just walk around the plant for hours. It's pretense. He was acting busy. But Jesus calls us to be disciples 24-7, to be ready, to be prepared in mind and in heart. And it's less about what we're doing in any given moment. It's not about It's it's about a right relationship with God through the righteousness of Christ applied to us and received by faith, because we know we will be taken solely and certainly for the sake of Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Martin Luther was planting a tree. Somebody said, Martin, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? He said, I finished planting this tree. Because he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. We don't have to change and do. It's not a matter of, well, if I knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, 
I'd be at the food bank helping people because I want him to find me there, or I'd be keeping the nursery, or I would be uh, visiting a nursing home, or I'd be at church. No, we will be busy. We're called to faithful, loving obedience as dads and moms, as uh, parents and children, as, as grandparents, as citizens, as workers, as retirees, as students, whatever we do, we'll just be faithful in loving obedience, doing it when He comes. That's what we do. We don't have to act busy for Jesus. But He does call us to live faithfully, to seek to glorify and enjoy God every day, every moment, wherever we go, whoever's looking or when no one's looking, and in whatever we do. Are you ready? As Christians, first of all, we, we do come to faith. But then as Christians, we prepare by being wise and discerning about the claims of religious hucksters and cultural and historical revisionists. We don't buy into all that. We, we're wise. We, we discern. We prepare by resting in the sovereign goodness of God, knowing that He is working all things together for our good and His glory, and knowing that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ. We prepare by trusting that He's creating opportunities for us to bear witness to Him and that He will give us the words to say when we need them. We prepare by learning to endure hardships so that we'll be ready when there are even greater hardships that come into our life. And we won't fall apart and we won't fall by the wayside saying, oh, why me? Why me? We prepare by refusing to allow ourselves to buy the lie that the things of this world are the most important things. And we prepare by praying each day as Jesus taught us to pray, that God would be glorified in our lives, that God's will would be done, that God's kingdom will come, and for grace and strength to face whatever comes into our lives until He comes again. Beloved, God is the main agent of our salvation. God, in His free, sovereign grace, is calling people to Himself even now through the gospel. And every day really counts for followers of Christ. Are you ready? The Lord's Supper is one of the ordinary means of grace that Jesus has given to us to help us be ready because at this table we specifically remember the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ until He comes again. All of that's contained in this, and we're to do it often and remember Him. And so we come to this table, and any who uh, by grace have received Christ and are trusting Him, you are invited, welcomed, and encouraged to eat and drink of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus given for you. The Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, after giving thanks, took bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat it and remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. For when you eat this bread, when you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Even this that Jesus instituted was to help us to be ready, always. And so, Lord, we thank you for the bread and cup, and we pray you would set it apart and bless it to this holy purpose to encourage us, to remind us, and to ready us for that great day, and to help us to live faithfully for you until that day. We give you thanks in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So the bread, the body of Christ, was given. We distribute this and ask that you would hold these elements. 
that we may uh, partake of the bread uh, together. There is one body, the body of Christ, and we are a part of it. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. The Son of Man is certainly coming again, as he said, and by his grace and every provision that has been made. We can be ready, and this too is to encourage us in just that way. The body of Christ given for you, receive it with thanksgiving and be ready. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood given for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Our time at the Lord's table is a means of grace out of thankfulness for what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. We draw on that grace, His sweetness. Prayer of thanksgiving will be on the screen. We'll be reading that together. Heavenly Father, who by the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, has visited us with your salvation. Grant that as we welcome our Redeemer, his presence may be shed abroad in our hearts and homes with the light of heavenly joy and peace. And in all our preparations for this holy season, 
Help us to think more of others than of ourselves, and to show forth our gratitude to You for Your inexpressible gift, Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Lord, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest with you and abide with you now and until he comes again. Be ready. Amen. Amen.